Cool. Well, I, I think it's a few minutes after the hour. We'll go ahead and kick things off. Um, let me hop back over here. All right. So just to go through our agenda real quick, we're going to start with introductions. Um, then we always have our, our vet to viz section um, or our vet to viz story um, kind of segment of the event. Then we'll introduce Eric and we'll talk a little bit about the challenge introduction, how that's going to work. Um, and then stay tuned. We also have our job board, uh, future event announcements, and then we'll have some closing remarks and some opportunity to open it up to discussion and networking. So to kick things off, uh, this is our leadership team. Uh, it's Tim, Abe, Lou, Jade, and myself. Um, and again, here's our Twitter, Twitter, Twitter handles, um, as well as our LinkedIn um, links. I just noticed this isn't very valuable to you guys because it's not like you can click into what I'm sharing right now. Uh, but I can send these out later. Um, if you guys want to connect with us, feel free. Search us on LinkedIn. You can connect there. Also, our group um, URL is down here for LinkedIn. Feel free to join the group um, for future event announcements. You can also find us on there and connect with us uh, through the group. All the LinkedIn is all on the uh, on our splash page, the hub page too, where you are RSVP and everything like that. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, we have all our links there if you want to connect with us. Um, all right, I'll go ahead and kick it off with the vet to viz story. So if you guys are unfamiliar with this process, what we like to do is just kind of open it up to the audience and allow you guys to tell us your story. Um, maybe it's how you went from being in the military to working in data. Um, it could be, you know, if you're not a veteran, if you're more advocate, uh, it could be how you got started in data um, and what that transition looked like. Um, but I'll go ahead and open it up to any volunteers If not, maybe I can start with myself. Um, so I got started in data right after I joined the military. Uh, when I was in high school, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So obviously only one thing you can do at that point and that's join the army. So I joined the army um, and when I got out, uh, I started perusing the GI Bill. Um, I wanted to take advantage of that. And I, I went to college as a computer science major to begin with. Um, as a computer science major, I quickly realized, you know, I didn't really want to do calculus and stuff like that for my entire life. Uh, so I started talking to my guidance counselor and he mentioned that there's this kind of new thing called data. Um, and it's, it's making big, uh, big changes in the business world. So he said, it's, it's more or less, uh, statistics heavy, less calculus and things like that, which I was very interested in. So I transitioned over to that. Um, started getting involved with uh, working in R and Python. And then I took a class on Tableau and I was immediately just drawn to the power of it. Being able to visualize data, there's one quote that I found that uh, has really in in inspired me throughout my journey. And that's that, you know, anybody in the world can understand a line chart and what that represents. It's almost like a universal language. Um, so I've really taken that and it's inspired me to um, kind of back Tableau and what they do. And it's brought me to where I am today. Um, I started, got a job out of college as a marketing analyst and then uh, went to an e-commerce company here in Kansas City. And really just through the power of data, just grown in my career. Um, I'm currently the senior manager of analytics engineering at Playfair Data, uh, where I do consulting for businesses all over the world. So um, absolutely love data, absolutely love Tableau and how easy it is to use. Um, that's kind of my, my journey. Uh, I'd love to open it up and hear from anybody else. I think uh, Jason, he, he was about to tell his story. Perfect, yeah, jump in. Yeah, I'll go. I mean, it, I'll try to like keep it short, but it's a, whole, a long story. I've been out for over 20 years. I'm, I'm an army vet. Uh, I joined in 96, straight out of high school. Um, I was a um, active duty, 96 to 2000. I was a combat engineer. Um, I knew I wanted to kind of fill my dad's footsteps, you know, or fill my dad's shoes kind of thing. Uh, he was a Vietnam vet in the Marine Corps. Um, I went Army, uh, but I wanted to build things, blow them up. Like I, they really sold it to me. <laughs> and I did love, love my experience in the military. 
Um, but I, but I took what I learned out of there. I gave myself a very short window. I only went, I wasn't a lifer. I, I had already had plans before I even joined the military, but it was one of those check marks that I wanted to like, almost like uh, college. I knew I wasn't going to be like college oriented. Um, I'm just, I'm more of a hands-on. I love being busy and working and doing things. So, and I grew up as an airbrush artist and a, you know, like just a creator. I loved building things and making things. Um, so I knew I wanted it to be in that realm of what I wanted to do after the military. But for the longest time, especially before social media really came out, um, what I had noticed is that I kind of forgot that I was a veteran until like social media came out. And it was like, I heard all this, you know, thank you for your service. Cause you know, I'm wearing civilians, uh, civvy clothes and I'm walking around and like, they don't know I'm a veteran. I don't wear a veteran hat or anything like that. I just kind of forgot about it. But then social media started coming out. Um, and my business, I've always owned my own business after the military. It's been in some form of art. I've been uh, a serigrapher. I printed t-shirts and you know, uh, I'm a graphic artist and an airbrush artist. I've painted motorcycles. I've just always been in that art scene of marketing. Um, so I've been in business and when, so my last company that I just had was called the Zinc Factory and it was a business that I did. And what I did was I helped um, other nonprofits and charities out there. I helped them fundraise and be able to get all of their, their fundraiser to cost them nothing and help them raise and help out their cause. So I helped them with sponsors and stuff like that. So, but what had happened was, was, was during that time, I noticed a lot of uh, veteran groups and things out there um, that were just spreading awareness and nobody was actually, there, no one was actually solving a problem. I saw the problem out there. I saw that veterans are committing suicide and I'm seeing all these things that are out there. And I wanted to try to find, I'm like, why is no, and I'm, you know, I have the engineer in me. I love solving problems and fixing things, you know? Um, it was kind of my military way and my upbringing from my Marine Corps father um, is to, you know, adapt and overcome and try to find a solution to a problem instead of sitting around bitching about it, so to speak. Um, so I was like, why not this, you know? So I created this organization called Operation Combat Bike Saver. And um, basically it's a distractive therapy where we build, I teach them how to build a motorcycle or, you know, tear it apart, fix it, every nut and bolt, go through it, customize it however they want. They have a $2,000 budget. It's a completely free program. We've been going for six years now, um, but it's a distractive camaraderie based um, atmosphere. So, um, so far, you know, it's six years later, um, a lot's happened, but you know, now I actually work for the organization. Um, so, a lot of things have happened, but that's kind of my story of transitioning from, um, you know, military into post-service is into now I love teaching. And on the data end, um, I've been collecting for over, I use Jot for them and I have, I'm using the PCL fives and the Bex depression. I'm using what the inventories that, that the, um, our universities are asking for. Um, in the realm of psychology. So we're collecting that. And I've been collecting it for almost four years. And I've been collecting in my areas, but also the areas that they want me to collect. Um, so I'm doing qualitative and quantitative. Um, and now they've stopped collecting, and they're ready to publish. So I've been getting studied for almost four years now. And I'm hoping that, that here, they're supposed to be presenting to us here in the middle of November. And then they're supposed to be publishing the end of December. So I, I'm new to the data collection kind of thing and seeing where I'm very statistic, you know, background. I love statistics. So, I mean, I don't have a college background in it, but I love seeing those numbers of how things are working and, and that qualitative quantitative area. Um, so I'm anxious to see kind of like how it turns out and, you know, and learn from my data collecting and, and how to better, you know, improve upon things. I always want to improve. So this is kind of all new to me. So that's my story. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, thank you for sharing. That's that's incredibly valuable. And, you know, this group, I think you'll fit right in. Um, I think we share a lot of the same values. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. We'll have to touch base um, sometime soon because um, I'd like to understand a little bit more about that. That's That's awesome. I love that. Is there anybody else uh, wanting to share their story?
Uh, hi, everybody. This is Adrian. Yeah, I can go ahead and jump in. Cool. Uh, I guess I may be one of the guys who's not a veteran, but has been working with the VA for a number of years uh, as a uh, from the private uh, sector. Uh, my involvement with the VA goes back to 2003, 2004, when we were working on uh, redesigning the benefits delivery network. So we had a set of requirements to uh, provide so that they can build a new system on that. It took us three years and uh, we delivered a huge document, 500 pages plus, <laughs> having traveled also uh, different locations like uh, St. Louis, the uh, Veterans Processing Centers, understanding the delivery network entirely. So that was quite an experience. Uh, Tableau came to me uh, in 2009 after I first served in the VA, and that was with Fannie Mae. In those days, the early version of Tableau was not as user-friendly as it is today. And uh, <laughs> we had to do a lot with SQL to try to get the data in. Uh, but the leadership liked it, and one of them had a really good vision of Tableau saying, guys, this is going to be one of the big things coming in in the industry. And he was right. Uh, later on, I... Uh, helped the FAA back in 2016, and this is human capital framework. So towards December 2016, the federal government put out a human capital framework with HR stat. So we worked with uh, the FAA as the liaison with the Office of Personal Management to uh, kind of normalize the standard statistic for human capital management. And we had a full day in our agency symposium at GSA headquarters. And uh, one guy who represented GSA showed very nice designs of Tableau dashboards, which was exactly what we were doing at the FAA. And the conversation was very interesting. We pointed out how you can make sure that only the user authorized to see certain levels of data can see it on the dashboard and not everyone. Uh, so the security levels of Tableau were very important to answer those questions. Uh, after I served with the FAA in 2016, I went to the Tableau user conference. Uh, now, this is worldwide. That's 2016 was Austin. Um, if one day you have the opportunity, I recommend it. Um, you have data night out, data ninja. Um, during the day, you have 16,000 people in the city. That's impressive. All hotels full. Um, you pick up where you want to go. And uh, you can also use that to do your certification. So that would be a credit for you. Um, the Tableau user group of DC is a place that I have been for many years until COVID came. And we became a little bit distant. Not as much activity as it used to be. Um, but I do recommend also joining with the DCW user group. Um, at the VA, I came back with Tableau in 2018. This is with the operations, um, uh, what they call major incident management. Some of you may be aware of some of the incidents being rated as priority one and priority two. And those being also a source for a number of reporting correlating what applications or what are the root causes of most of the incidents and reporting that on the dashboard for the CIO brief every morning. Um, after that work, I'm still with the VA, but this time it's for the benefits integration platform. Uh, it's a little bit different, uh, but still it's an area where dashboards and uh, visualizations are relevant. I just don't know whether I'll be involved in that at this point. Because at this level, I'm more into the business analysis side of things for the solutioning team. Okay. I'm happy to, to have this because uh, the invite came. I really didn't know um, uh, who I was going to meet, but listening to you guys, I'm excited to share our knowledge. And also, you can see on LinkedIn, I also run a uh, private company, company that has some visualizations, um, Tableau, and besides Tableau, we have our own solution that you can take a look at.
Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing, Adrian. I really yeah, appreciate it. Adrian, um, I, so I, I worked for VA for seven yeah. years, and then um, I now work for the FAA. And my, wow. my, my wife works for the data office still at the VA. And I know a lot of people in the human capital office at the FAA. So I'm, I'm sure we, we know a lot of mutual people. And I've also been the DC user group too, so. Okay, great. Maybe yeah. we cross, cross paths without knowing it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I was just about to say that, Tim. That's hilarious. You just I, was at the, I was also at the Austin uh, Tableau user, uh, the conference too, so. <laughs> you were there? Wow, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, uh, you know, we'll get back to it maybe offline. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. There, there were some funny moments about global warming. Oh, yeah, Bill, yeah. Bill, Bill Nye, I don't know if you... Bill, Bill Nye, yeah, he's, uh, yeah, yeah. He was, he was funny. But anyway, so yeah. great. Th thanks for joining. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. And it, it just goes to show, like, I mean, even the military community is a small niche, as, you know, we all know. But here, the data, the data side of things, like the Tableau community, you know, it's also very small, but and it just, it's so great to like connect with folks. And then there's always a mutual connection in the crowd. I just love it. Every time we have an event, there's something like this. So it's just great to see that. Yeah. Um, let me go ahead and transition over. Uh, we wanted to talk about a little bit about the data challenge and introduce kind of the idea around it before we, before we hear from Eric. So as you guys know, this, this Tableau user group is kind of unique, um, actually very unique in the fact that, you know, it's a community that's driven for veterans advocacy, but we also want to partner with organizations that share our same values and advocate for vet veterans as well and help them out. Um, and the way we do this is kind of throughout our partnership together is we want to help them understand their data and also spread awareness of their mission um, and what they're trying to achieve. From the community and our membership for the user group, it's also a great opportunity to expand your own portfolio by, per, by participating in these challenges, but also to learn. Um, there's opportunities for you to gather feedback on your work. Um, through the leadership team here, you can uh, submit your work to us. Um, and it also, you know, more importantly than any of that, you're giving back to the community and helping out a great cause. Um, so a little bit about the data challenge. Uh, what we're hoping to do is hear from Eric, um, find out what their mission is. Uh, he's provided us some data and we want to introduce that out through the members. Um, and then hopefully uh, we can have some participants that will uh, build out Tableau visualization using those data um, and submit that out. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce Eric. He's the founder, president, and elite cyclist at Project Echelon. And their mission really is to educate, equip, and empower veterans and the, their communities through physical activity and self-discovery. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to stop right, sharing I, and turn it over to Eric. Well, actually, uh, uh, Ethan, I was going to step in for a second. So sure, yeah. um, I just wanted to give a little background on how Eric and I met. Excuse me, a little... I'm um, getting over a sinus infection, so I'm a little nasally. Sorry if I sound like Kermit the Frog or something. But uh, so um, so I, in my spare time, I, I do cycle and I, and I did the Armed Forces um, uh, Challenge, the Armed Forces Classic in, um, in the D.C. area. And um, I did the challenge part, which is just basically uh, riding around um, a six mile course and see how, see how many times you can do it. So I did, did that, but also um, within this armed forces classic, they have um, levels of cyclists. And the next day was um, um, they were gonna have the, um, the, uh, the professional cyclist race. And I didn't have a team to support. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really, I was just getting into, into professional, um, uh, watching professional cycling anyway, not really participating in it. And I went through the list of teams because I had a team or no, my friend had a team and um, I wanted to go down there and I wanted to follow somebody. So I went down the list and I said, uh, I saw Project Echelon. I was like, oh, what are these guys about? So I clicked on it and um, saw that they're about veterans and whatever. And I was like, all right, well, that settles it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be supporting them. And um, we had uh, the veterans user group. Um, I reached out to, to Eric and I believe the, the Sunday after the race, um, he got back to me that day saying that he, he wanted to work with us, which was awesome. 
So um, I really appreciate that. And so s since then, we've been talking to each other, getting getting some data. Um, but that's, uh, that's a little bit of background. So now, without further ado, uh, Eric, if you want to take it away and, and talk about um, Project Shalane. Well, and you, you forgot, Tim, to mention that that was possibly one of the most epic races ever in that um, Stephen Bogle, one of our riders, won the race two times in a well, single race. He uh, <laughs> he misread the lap counter and celebrated well, the lap early. Well, Eric, I, th I think I think I mentioned to you that um, during when he, I was going to let you say that he won that. So uh, yeah. when he, in his vict when he was talking to the reporter or whoever it was, um, he said, "I swear, I heard somebody say one lap to go," and he had that in mind when when he did it. And I yelled right after the uh, when he passed me. Uh, two laps to go, Steve. And I was like, I swear I said one lap. To, uh, I swear I said two laps to go. So I may have been in the reason and he, and he misheard me, but whatever. <laughs> well, now you're, now you're paying it forward and we won't hold it against you. He still won the race in <laughs> yeah. epic fashion. So, right. Yeah. That was pretty cool. Uh, and then today I'm also joined by Zach Gregg. Um, Zach is also one of the elite riders on the Project Echelon racing team. And uh, we'll talk about the relationship between, you know, a professional cycling team and a veterans nonprofit and what that looks like and why it's structured that way. But Zach does all of our onboarding and coaching support for the veterans that we work with. Uh, Zach has a master's degree in sports physiology, um, so extremely knowledgeable in that regard, and is a multiple time national champion himself um, in the time trial discipline. So uh, we, we have some talent um, in our program, and we're just um, honored to be able to share that with, with people. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and we'll go through um, a presentation that I, I put together, but please feel free to stop me um, at any point if you guys have questions or wanna dig into something. Um, you can also, if you want to dig through as I'm going through the presentation, maybe pull up on your screen and scroll through our website um, project echelon racing.com, um, is our team site. If you go to project echelon.org, um, that is, uh, more specific to our, our nonprofit page. Um, and, um, and the, the news that's there. So two different places you can go, but they're directly linked to one another. Um, so here's the project echelon.org page. All right, so Project Echelon was founded in 2016. Um, so we're coming up on six years um, of, of being around and, uh, and having a positive influence on our veteran community. Um, our mission is to educate, equip, and empower veterans through physical activity. Um, and our vision is that we can use um, our platform to educate, equip, and empower veterans in that way. And as, as an organization, uh, we try to remove barriers to healing by fostering relationships between veterans and their community and professional athletes through mentorship, structure, and the promotion of long-term health and well-being through endurance sport. Um, you guys are all uh, um, prior service members. You know that there is a massive benefit to physical activity, whether it's your physical health, your mental health, or camaraderie, and having something that you can go through together, that you experience together, um, and that you can that you can come together around. And we feel the same way um, about endurance sport, similar to what you were, Jason, sharing about with um, with building bikes too, right? Like that's a common experience that can bring people together in a unique way. That's not related to, you know, to alcohol. That's not related to um, other things that are, are negative distractors in life. These are positive distractors as Jason described them. I really liked that term. Um, I'm gonna come back to this in a second. I, it's a short video that I, I do wanna play for you, um, but I'm gonna share our kind of inception story first and then go back to that video. Um, so in 2016, veteran friend of mine um, on the right of this picture, uh, Eric Beach reached out to me, um, having let me know that he had just made a third attempt at suicide. He was struggling with drug and alcohol addiction um, and clearly suicidal ideation. And um, he basically just laid it out and said, if I can't find a path forward, 
to change my life, I'm going to end up taking it. Um, and so his wife, who was friends um, with my wife, said, why don't you reach out to Eric? Um, he can help you with your goal of becoming physically active again. He knew for himself that when he was in the military, physical activity is what kept him grounded, grounded gave him purpose, and find connections um, with people. And that was missing in his life post-service. Um, so he reached out to me. I was racing at an elite level at the time, um, wanting to take the next step forward in my own career and race at the professional level um, and had a number of resources that were available to me as elite athletes were very privileged to have sponsors, supporters, um, connections with, with events and the communities they have their events in um, to remove those barriers to sport for ourselves. And I simply made those um, same resources available to Eric. I helped him put together a training program, um, identify a goal that he wanted to complete, which was to do a, an Olympic um, triathlon, um, helped him get the equipment he needed to do that. Uh, so a bicycle, access to running equipment, training plans, nutrition, um, all of those things. Endurance sport can sometimes be a, um, a high barrier to entry because of all the knowledge and experience that it takes to do it successfully. And the last thing I wanted was for him to set this goal and pursue something that he knew was going to be life-changing and fail at it. I knew that that could potentially be life-threatening for him. Um, so together we went through this journey and six months later, Eric not only completed his first triathlon, um, he had admitted himself um, to receive help for his addiction issues and his suicidal ideation. A year later, uh, Eric was featured on a television show by NDC um, called The Quest for Kona um, to complete Ironman um, and compete at Ironman Kona in Hawaii. Um, from there, we had tons of veterans reach out sharing how he was an inspiration to them. And we decided that we were going to start um, a foundation that would do just that, would help veterans uh, find self-empowerment um, through physical activity. In order to do that, um, we needed more people than myself to help. And I decided to start my own pro cycling team um, as a means to do that. On our team, every member is responsible for coaching, mentor mentoring, uh, relationship building, um, capacity building with our veteran community. And Zach is a central um, component to that process and helping to onboard um, people to help build relationships with them and understand what their goals are. Um, so I'm gonna share a, a video with you all. Um, it's about nine minutes in length, so hopefully it's not too long, but it'll give you some good insights of who is Project Echelon Racing? What is the, what is the racing team about? How are we directly connected to the veterans that we work with? And how do we work with industry partners, bike companies, helmet companies, clothing companies to help close the gap um, or close the, remove the boundaries or, or barriers to entry for the veterans that we serve? This organization does what we say and we say what we mean. We're an organization that's about people helping people and we reach through a common modality that speaks to just about everybody in the United States and that's sport. So team camp is the kickoff of our season. The guys on the team come from you know every corner of the United States. Uh, actually we even have a guy on the team from New Zealand. I might not race more than one or two days with some of these other guys. Team Camp affords that opportunity where you can really level up your game and, and get something from people that you might not race with very much. Coming together at camp is essential. Um, if we're going to be successful throughout the season, we need to know each other. We need to trust each other. We need to know how you're going to operate, what motivates you, what doesn't. This sport is, it requires teamwork. It requires family. It requires trust. Having that balance within our team where you, you look to some of the guys and you know they're just gonna like cut the tension when things are 
tough or, or rough. So you're telling me cold water boils faster. We'll get to a water. rolling boil faster, faster than warm water. water. That is so false. All right, somebody look it up. Right, warm water, water boils faster than colder water, and it's a myth to say colder water. <laughs> No, no, but there is, I mean, there's you, something, there's something else is what I've heard. Like, there's something, I forget what it is. Maybe it freezes, maybe warm water freezes faster than cold water. That's also I mean, false. I mean, that nine, is also very false. Let's look it up. That feels just I get wrong. nine out of ten. It's literally like the transitive property, like. No. Transitive property. It's what possible under nine certain nine conditions, but it's not true. As in, actually, the warm water is actually cold water, and it freezes faster. <laughs> Yeah, our, I think our team is pretty, pretty awesome in that there's so much balance, and even the guys who are at polar opposites of the personality spectrum are, are such good friends um, that like it, we drive off of that instead of like butting heads or anything. This year too, I think we've added some really valuable staff, and they have just created this amazing program with specific workouts, specific you know goals for each day involve the entire team. So it's less of a lead out style and more of a collective trying to lead out on a pretty stiff climb with people trying to get in the way. This is essentially what's gonna happen. Yeah, so let's let's hit it, let's cruise. Um, you know, you don't need to throttle it on the front, but keep it, keep steady pressure and then feel free to roll as quick as you want, as fast as you want. It's a big day, like 120 miles. And I think we got three or four different sets of chase drills where we're gonna be sending some guys up the road have a chase group working together, bring them back over the course of 6K. Just trying to really calculate that effort and make sure we're talking, communicating well. Um, and I, it'll be nice because Isaiah's gonna have the ability to pull up, give us instructions, and we gotta adapt to that. Cycling is one of those moments where you're truly in the present for the majority of the time you're on the bike. And I think that's really hard for people to do just in their daily lives. And on the bike, it's like everything slows down and you can really just take account for everything that's going on in your life. And it gives you the opportunity to really reach, I think, deep inside yourself, especially if you're out in a five hour day, you know, you get broken down to a very raw emotional level sometimes. And sometimes that exposes some really hard things, but some really great things at the same time. You know, utilizing cycling as a way to get through trauma or stress has been something that I think all of us have on one level or another experience, which is another part of, I think, I think, our collective purpose and our strength as an organization. You know, for me personally, cycling has been a way to not just unplug or to ignore other things that have been stressful in life, but it's been a way to really process them through that meditative purpose and that almost spiritual experience of, of being on the bike for a long period of time and feeling that sense of, of work and accomplishment. And I think that that's a shared understanding for a lot of us at this organization. Cycling is important to me because it just, it's what gives me balance. Um, and it what, it's what helps me see purpose in everything else I do in my life. Whether it's being a dad, uh, being a husband, my job in education, it ties all of it together. Um, and it helps me kind of build that storyline of, of victories and failures, of hard efforts and struggle and triumph. But success on the road for us also means success as a nonprofit. It leads to new opportunities to connect with veterans in ways that we haven't before. It leads to new partnerships that make equipment and you know training knowledge and all of these things that serve as barriers to our veteran community and makes those more accessible. It's what motivates our guys to do the little things the right way. They know people are watching them. They know that they're um, inspiring them. They know that they're empowering them in unique ways. I, I really do think like it gives them just some advantage that they have over the other teams because like those veterans and their responsibility to them and all that sort of stuff is gonna be there on Monday whether they had like their best race or their worst race over the weekend. So they just don't have time to have a long memory of any experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? Cause it's like they have to be stable for like this, this bigger thing that they're doing. We talk about this a lot. When you're working for someone else, you can go 10, 20 times deeper that you could if you were just trying to work for yourself. So being able to work with veterans and kind of understand what they went through and what they still go through allowed me to just kind of better a lot of areas in my own life and just have like a deeper understanding and appreciation for 
a lot of the things like that we take for granted on a daily basis. Educate, equip, and empower. I mean, it's those are like three pillars that, as a team, you just kind of learn. And like that fourth bar, I think, just represents two people from different backgrounds kind of coming together for a similar goal and just really creating like this deep sense of understanding of different perspectives of life. The fourth bar to me is the echelon. It's the community. Um, people ask like, what does Project Echelon mean? What, where did that name come from? And it's really a group of people working together towards a common goal, sharing the effort and rotating through just like we would in an echelon in a race. And for me, it's at the bottom as well because it's the foundation of it all. And without it, everything else crumbles. I think it would either be community or mentorship because yeah, the, the role that I fill for the veterans is a mentor and a coach. Um, but the role that my teammates fill for me is very similar. I'd have to probably say the word embrace. Embrace the process, embrace the training, embrace the therapeutic aspect. Personally, come out of it, I've been able to embrace people I might not have had the same political ideologies as, or backgrounds, interests, things that drove me. Um, but um, embracing this community and embracing each individual voice and letting that feel welcome and held um, has been a part of my experience in this that has been really cool. We are an organization that is about people helping people, regardless of their situation. You could be one of the top veteran cyclists in the country and we want to help you because uh, that's what we do like I want to reach my hand out and say how can I help and our guys are a part of that solution they're a part of that network you're gonna lose more often than you win and you have to be able to pick out what the wins are within those losses that's an important lesson um, and you need to be able to then capitalize on them learn from them, and use them to tackle your next win. Measuring yourself by the result of a single event is a good way to be disappointed, especially in a sport where so few people win the most often. If you didn't give up and you did the best that you can, you just got beat. You didn't actually lose. You can't be you have binary where it's either win or lose, because um, that's how uh, people have short lifespans within the sport, um, because it is so difficult. Without sport, we wouldn't reach the community in the way that we need to. And without the community, we wouldn't have a team. Um, both of those things come together to make something beautiful and that's Project Echelon. All right, so hopefully that gives you some insight as to who we are and how the two arms of our program work together um, using the, the team, as a means to do outreach and connect and educate and provide uh, access to endemic sponsors and, um, and remove barriers. And then using our veteran community um, as a means to help us all learn and grow and, um, and really be in, this, be in this together. Our, our why, um, I, I don't think I need to dive too deep into this. I mean, we're all here probably for similar reasons, but we know an average of 22 veterans a day um, lose their life to, to suicide, um, that a, a large majority of our veterans uh, maybe either have undiagnosed or um, diagnosed PTSD if they've been in action. And uh, too many of our veterans struggle from the same alcohol and drug addiction um, that Eric Beach, um, our co-founder, struggled with, and we need to give them alternative tools to tackle that. And so I'm gonna let uh, Zach Gregg introduce himself and talk about, well, what does that process look like for us? Um, and then Zach, if you wanna talk about too, how we've got to a point where we're, we're growing and we have, we, we're gonna be changing our model because of that as we talk about scalability and sustainability. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm Zach Gregg. Um, I do the onboarding um, and the majority of the coaching for our veterans. Um, and so I serve as the primary point of contact for people who want to join our community. Um, so what we try to provide every veteran um, is some structure um, and some knowledge of the sport that they're interested in. 
um, specifically uh, endurance sport, um, in order to give them something within their day uh, that needs to be accomplished and is difficult. So um, we do this by identifying their goals using a smart goal sheet um, on intake that I then use to discuss like how we progress with each individual person and how we as an organization can fit their needs. Um, so, uh, through that process, you know, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of at attachment that, that has been created. Um, and so we have like a really good, strong base and foundation and they feel comfortable from the time that they start working with us to ask difficult questions, um, and incorporate themselves into our veteran community group. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, it's proven to be very powerful from the, from the outset. Um, we, we then try and assign a veteran mentor, um, to these athletes so that they have, or, uh, sorry, uh, elite cycling mentor to these athletes so that they have somebody who speaks the same language as them, who understands their struggle just from a completely different perspective. Um, and so as it stands now, um, we're serving close to 250, 300 veterans. Um, I personally coach, um, about 70 of these guys. Um, and so scaling is a dramatic, uh, issue where we're just kind of running out of time to, to do, uh, things how we have. Um, so we're switching to more of a cohort model in that we're separating, um, a select number of veterans every six months into small regional based groups, allowing them to, um, select events within their region to compete as a group. Um, and whether those are for completion or for a specific result, like that's kind of up to them. Um, and since we are so regional as a team, it will allow us to have team members go to these events with the veterans and act as support, um, you know, and take them through how we dissect an event and to better understand, you know, the preparation, the level of, of fitness, what are the kind of benchmarks in uh, like preparing for these events that you should be able to hit in order to maximize your success um, on that race day or on event day. Um, so that's something we're starting on January 1st. And we're hoping to serve 25 veterans in the first cohort that will go January 1st through the end of June. Um, and then, you know, if that proves to be achievable, we'll be able to open it up for more veterans to participate in the second cohort um, that starts July 1st. Eric, I think um, you're on mute. Yep. So some of this will come out, um, you know, over the course of, um, of the data that Tim and his team have pulled together to, to share, but, um, you know, we, we, um, have continuously grown over our six years and this number is wrong. I apologize. There's a one in front of there and there shouldn't be, um, 2020, we supported 207 veterans. As Zach said, we're now to um, push into 250, 300 for, uh, 2021. Um, and so as it stands, um, you know, we, we continue to grow year over year. Uh, there's increased interest by just community members wanting to know how they can get involved and learn more about veteran issues um, and be more supportive in that regard. But then there's also more veteran um, involvement year over year. And so regardless of whether or not a vet reaches out and they get placed into one of our cohort groups, they're still going to be welcomed into our community and supported. Um, that will just look and feel a little bit different for our cohort group versus our community group. Um, with that too, you probably saw that we have, like I said, a number of sponsors um, on our on our jerseys. One of the things that we've increasingly done is worked with them um, to do better job of hiring, training, retaining, and upskilling veterans in the workplace. Um, so working with companies like Traceomatic, which is a custom CNC machining company that has a, a number of DOD contracts, um, they hire a large number of veterans but there's also a large um, amount of veteran turnover there. So we're not only helping them with that hiring process, but we're also trying to help them with um, that retention process and that upskill process. 
Um, and so we're doing that in a, a number of different areas, including IT um, with a company called Milliman, including uh, you know manufacturing, construction, um, a whole variety of areas. So trying to find creative ways to support beyond uh, just physical activity and endurance sport, but physical activity and endurance sport is really our central um, means to connecting with people. Um, let's see here. Let me come back to. I just want to highlight a couple of really awesome stories, and then. Um, and then I'll open it up for questions or whatever our next part of today's discussion is, Tim. Um, but if you go to our newsletter and we do a newsletter quarterly and there's some just really wonderful stories that um, I think you, you all would love to hear. Um, you know, this working with Tim really pushed me to think more qualitatively or quantitatively, I'm sorry, quantitatively about the work that we do and how do we measure that and represent that. And, um, so much of what we have done in the past is, is qualitative in nature and just storytelling and sharing. Um, you know, so we always do a veteran feature story. For example, Zach um, and our team have worked with this gentleman, Dennis Connors, who's a disabled veteran, um, who won two national championships this year. Um, he rides a, um, a bicycle that we helped him to adapt. So you can see this is the same bike that the team rides on, but it's actually a tricycle um, so that he can um, compete um, you know, with, with, his, with his disability. Um, we had a veteran win gold this year in the Tokyo Olympics that we work with. Um, her name is Sean Morelli. Um, so we, you know, we have this amazing opportunity to work with these really elite athletes that want to use this platform as a means to share their story, um, but to also work with individuals like Darren Hunnell, um, and Ken Robinson, who just completed a ride across the United States. Um, they started in San Diego. They finished in Washington, D.C. They took 22 days to do that ride as a team. Um, and they raised enough money for us to donate 48 bicycles to veterans in need at the end of, of this year. Um, and so, you know, they would not consider themselves to be elite in any regard, um, but they're passionate and they're connected to us by the bike. And, um, and they believe in, in our mission and, and what it can do for other people as well, which is why they set that goal to raise funds to donate bikes and, um, and remove those barriers to entry. So I'd encourage you to check out our newsletter to learn more as well. So that's what I had, Tim, and I, I don't know what next steps are, but I'm happy to answer any questions as well if that's appropriate at this time. Yeah, definitely. Uh, anybody have any questions for him? If not, I, I definitely do. So um, you're mainly just uh, cycling, correct? Uh, is there any other uh, sport that you that you support currently or in the past? Yeah, we have um, a number of, of multi-sport athletes. Um, triathlon is is probably the primary, um, but triathletes, do athletes, um, cyclists, um, and then we have a lot of endurance running athletes as well. Um, and then we have some folks that, you know, they use our, our training plans and they modify them so that they can get fit enough to hike Denali or mm -hmm. to do something like that. So maybe they're not looking to be competitive or even, uh, you know, apply the bike in a competitive setting, but they're just trying to get fit enough so that they can even be active with their, with their child at home. Okay. And so if, uh, there's an interested veteran uh, on the call, or uh, if we, you know, tell friends about it, how can they apply, and and, and uh, what's the what's the requirements of actually? Um... So, yeah, um, on the web page, there's a contact form, and I'll just drop it in um, in the chat um, that you you can fill out. I think one of the things that makes Project Echelon extremely unique is that there is no requirement. The only requirement is that you're a veteran. Um, mm -hmm. We, one of Eric, one of the things that Eric Beach was extremely passionate about as we started this was the fact that he felt blessed to get the services that he received because he was medically disabled. However, if he was not recognized as being medically disabled, but still struggled from symptoms of PTS or, uh, 
maybe had um, injury that wasn't, you know, a, a legitimate physical disability, but had disc degeneration in his back or something like that, he wouldn't have qualified for the services that he was able to receive to ultimately save his life. And mm-hmm. so we decided that our only, our only thing was that you had to be a veteran and that's it. Okay. Any other questions out there? I have a question. Uh, so um, I'm just wondering about your, um, like the structure of your organization. Are you, so you're a company supporting we are, your company supporting we are, we are a nonprofit a, or? No, we are a 501c3. So the whole organization's a 501c3. Um, the, the professional racing team, like I said, if when a, when a partner comes on, there's a requirement for them to provide resources um, to, to the veterans that we work with as well. Um, without the team there, it's likely that as an organization, we would never be able to get those benefits. We would never be able to get pro level pricing on a bike, for example, right? Um, And then part of our sponsorship agreement is um, a minimum of 10% of all sponsor dollars goes to support our veteran cause. So the team was actually, the cycling team was founded um, before we officially started the, the veteran programming that we offer. At first, the 501c3 was set up uh, as really a uh, an advocacy group, and now it's more of a service group. If that makes sense. And I, I noticed um, that there's a virtual component. Are, are you uh, connected to to that, and, and how does that work? Yeah, so one of the things that we, as, as the pandemic came around, um, that we realized was um, if we weren't traveling to communities, that means we weren't, and we, and we weren't racing, that means we weren't reaching more people. Um, and so we needed to find a way to do that when that platform was removed from us. So we decided to turn to the virtual um, scene to do it. Um, and so if you've heard of, Zwift, um, that's a virtual racing platform. Uh, we actually work in collaboration with a competitor to Zwift that's not quite as well known, but um, has opened their doors to us in a, in a wonderful way called RGT Cycling. Um, and it's allowed us to put on a virtual racing league um, that benefits the, the nonprofit. Um, and so if you look up Echelon Racing League, um, I, can even, I can drop that in the chat as well. Um, but there is a complete league with virtual, I mean, it's esports, So it's a video game that you play by riding a bicycle. Um, so if, if that's something of interest to you, I think you might enjoy that too. At first I have to convince my wife that I, I get a trainer <laughs> and, and where, and where to put it. So well, we can, once you convince her of that, we, we can help. We have connections with a train, a trainer sponsor, and oh, nice. Um, yeah, I mean, so just for like reference and how we help to remove those those barriers, uh, a trainer indoor indoor smart trainer costs about twelve hundred bucks mm-hmm. um, at MSRP. Through for veterans that are part of our community that we work with, it costs about four hundred dollars, and then we offer oh, wow. um, financial stipends as well. Um, so we have. Uh, a special scholarship program where people can apply if they have financial or other needs. Um, but everybody currently is, um, has access to a $300 stipend that they can apply to something related to their SMART goal. So if they can directly show the relationship between getting a SMART trainer and their SMART goal, we'll provide them with a $300 reimbursement for that purchase. Oh, wow. That's great. Any other questions? Okay, I can take back the screen. Mm-hmm. Um, let me see. All right. Well, Tim, do you want to? Yes. Um, do, you wanna do this next part. Yeah, yeah. Since you already kind of right. flashed it a little bit. That's all right. 
So um, a tradition in the military, uh, which um, all veterans should be um, aware of is uh, exchanging of challenge coins. Um, so here at the uh, Veterans Advocacy Tableau User Group, uh, we like to present our uh, our challenge coin to all the speakers. So uh, Eric and, and Zach, you'll you'll be uh, receiving one of these if uh, uh, if you just give me a, a good address and we can set it on. But this is just to show our appreciation um, uh, to you and um, and uh, yeah, just thank you very much for for joining. Thank you. That's that's incredible. It's an, a nice uh, commemoration. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thank awesome. you. Thank yeah, you. Definitely. Thanks, guys. So now um, I have the the data that we've kind of collected over the past uh, uh, Jesus November now, so five months, I guess. Um, so I was just gonna scroll through that, and um, uh, actually, I do have a question for you guys, which is actually very important. So um, you want us to make a dashboard. Um, so who is your, your target, uh, audience, um, for this dashboard? What kind of questions do you want answered? Um, th things like that. So who, uh, so basically, um, why are we building this dashboard and, and, uh, we, we just want to help in any way that we can. Yeah. I, for me, you know, the target audience is, um, is kind of twofold. I think one is most certainly um, potential partners and then being able to see the positive impact that we have um, on the on the community that we serve. Um, I think everybody knows that you know donations are the driving force behind nonprofit organizations and people want to know that their donations are um, having the impact that they are hoping for. And so um, we, we want to be able to accurately represent that. Um, and then two, um, to really, to, to build some understanding and knowledge capacity in the general public, um, of how do services like this truly positively impact the people that are a part of it? Um, I think there's so often a general sense of that sucks, but I don't know how I can help kind of thing. Um, Jason, again, I'm, I'm stealing your stories, but you talked about how, like you see all these things happening, but then uh, people, they like, they just observe those problems. They don't fix those problems. And for us to be able to say, here's the problems that we observed, here's what we're doing to, to uh, overcome them. And here's the result of that shows people a path forward. Um, and I think for veterans coming in as well, it gives them hope that like this could be something that is life changing for them. This this is something that they're going to commit to because they know it's benefited other, other people in this way. Okay, great. Um, so with that, um, with that what, what you just said, we'll go over the uh, the data and if um, anybody has any any ideas or, or uh, questions that they want just just come and jump right in um let me see can i take over the screen ethan absolutely yeah go ahead Wait one second like this oh wait no i need that Oh, it's actually not letting you share. Great. Here, do you want to? Do you want me to share? Yeah, I'll I'll send you the links, and then we can go over it like that. Cool. Second. All right. I'm gonna put it in the. Uh, In the chat here. Okay. 
Okay. You see the link coming through? Yeah. All right. Pull it up. Just uh, sending you a few links here. So um, on their website, um, there's some uh, annual reports, which has some uh, useful information on that. So this is their 2019 annual report, uh, which shows uh, 100, uh, 104 veterans, uh, 38,000 in, uh, in grants and so on. Um, so you can, uh, this information can be used to uh, show in, in a dashboard to see how the the organization is growing and how many veterans that they, they're helping, things like that. Uh, and then if you want to click on the second one, that's that's their 2020 link. You got that? All right. Yep. And this is, oh, that looks like the 2019. Anyway, we'll just move on. Uh, so their, their uh, 2021 does uh, show just a, a little bit more uh, growth, uh, as it was covered, they're now doing uh, 207 veterans helped, and I think it was a uh, 31,000 for for the year of 2020. Um, so you can do a, a cumulative total and things like that. So th this stuff it would be really easy to to visualize and to show uh, potential investors things like that into the company to see that um, you are growing from year to year. Uh, and then we have. This study. No, wait. I know what's going on. I'm using a Mac with a with a um, PC keyboard, so it's a little bit tricky to use. Mm -hmm. All right, and then here's another link, and uh, this link that he's going to bring up. It's a Duke University uh, research that that shows uh, athletics helps with reducing the symptoms of uh, mental disabilities. And all these, um, in a second, we're, we're going to describe how to actually get access to this stuff. Um, we are we have a Slack channel, so we'll we'll walk through that later. Uh, once you go into the Slack channel, you'll be able to to link up to all these because uh, you will be able to see the uh, the what's um, the chat after we close it out. Okay, and then this one is uh just did another one for this is a a, v, um, a mental health from the va so it touches on um uh veterans specifically and uh the the benefits of physical activity so when you're doing your dashboard it's really good to add context and um a story behind it and what you really want to do is is, is to tell a story and not just have like you know uh uh, the the charts and the graphs to showing up. You need to add some context and, and tell a story with it. And some of the and some of these refer references can be integrated into it. So Eric uh, touched before that uh, he really wanted to get more uh, quantitative data uh, to show that it, show that the program was working. So what um, the admins of the the uh, this um, Tableau user group did. We helped him formulate a, a survey, and that survey was pushed out to veterans that were currently participating in the um, uh, with Project Echelon. And the survey shows asked a few questions about how was your um, your mental state before participating with Project Echelon, and how did how how is it now uh, with uh, varying different questions and and other data. Um, uh, included in that. So here is a Google Sheet, a Google Doc, uh, which has the, uh, the data that was captured. And uh, once you get access to the, the Slack, you can... I think my Google, uh, sorry, my Google dot was uh, was talking to me, but anyway. Uh, so, um, so this has like a number of years working with them prior. Uh, um, uh, what's this question here? Uh, prior to receiving support from Project Echelon, uh, my physical health was this and that. 
So uh, my initial observation is that this obje uh, objectively shows that um, the veterans participating in, in the program um, have benefited from this. So the testimonials are, are really great, but when you actually have uh, objective data to support that, that's even better. And uh, um, we can try to figure out creative ways to display this data. Um, so yeah, so uh, once everyone is has access to it, you, you guys could just uh, play around with it and, and build dashboards. And uh, yeah, I can go over. Oh, you got, oh, there you go. Yep. Yeah, I can go over that. So like Tim said, we, we wanted to preview what we had put together on our on the back end. Um, but to kind of kick off this quarterly challenge, the idea we had in mind was you'd be able to sign up to participate by just filling out a form. What it's going to do is send us your first name, last name, and email address. And at that point, we're going to add you to our Slack channel where you'd be able to access this data. Uh, so the whole, the whole uh, kind of outline of the quarterly challenge is you would take this data, um, you'll sign up to participate, You'll download that data uh, from the Slack channel that we're going to invite you to, create a Tableau visualization in Tableau, and you can submit your work to us kind of in two different ways. You could either submit it via email uh, by just emailing our tug group or via social media uh, by posting like a link to your Tableau public that has the, uh, the data visualization you've created, and you can tag um, using one of these hash hashtags here. Project test on data challenge or the viz for vets uh, hashtag. Let me get this link here. Let's see if I can copy that in. I'm going to publish this in the chat. There we go. All right. So from that Google form, uh, you should be able to click on that. And again, it should ask you your first name, last name, and email address. If you want to participate, you'll fill that form out. We'll add you to the Slack, and that's where you can get the data. One last caveat, especially if you're, if you're looking to build your portfolio, and especially if you're wanting to gather feedback from the, the leads here at the group on your work, uh, we would ask that you submit the work prior to this date, 11-22. Um, Personally, over the holidays, I'll probably be reviewing um, all of the all the work that comes through. Um, so that'll just give me sufficient time to dive in and, and really give you some quality feedback um, if that's something you're interested in. Um, of course, if you don't want any feedback, um, that's fine too. Does anyone okay. have any questions about the challenge itself or maybe how to participate um, or anything that wasn't clear from the instructions? Again, this is the first time we're doing it. So um, yeah, we'd love feedback too. And you're not limited to the, the data too. If you find some other uh, research to, to support what we're showing, then by all means, um, uh, you can use that. Erica, Zach, do you have any, uh, any other thoughts after seeing all that? Uh, no, I, I, the only other thing that I can think of is um, you know, for some people have left uh, personal anecdotes, um, you know, or reflections. And so how, how do we pair up the data with some of those quotes or reflections that people have left us, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, to me, the most powerful thing anybody's really ever said to me is like, they said, thank you for bringing my husband home. He's been home for three years. But for the first time, he's truly home. Like, mm. I can't, you can't put a number to that, you know, but, right. and that's something that people need to see and hear. Mm -hmm. um, and if it can be substantiated by data, great. But like, how do we, to me, that's the most meaning. I mean, that's, that's enough motivation for 10 years of work, you know? Right. Um, so how, how do we, how do we get that in there? Mm. Those testimonials are on your on the website. Is that correct, Eric? They are, yes. All right, let me see. Uh, can I, I 
have something to say. Um, so through my journey of the six years of, of running this organization and finding out from these different universities and trying to get published and studied because our organization is a little bit different when it comes to therapy based um, organizations that provide a service to veterans to combat their PTSD, their TBI, their depression, their post service, um, the things that they're going through to prevent them from committing suicide and prevent them from becoming homeless. So I kind of found out roughly what what is it that that um, the federal government our grantors the, to give us funding to run these kind of organizations um, and also the public um, how can they be um, educated in knowing whether or not we are legit or not like our form of therapy actually works so i had to find out on my own well first was the pcl uh, what is it, the PCL and the Beck's depression inventories. Now, these are data collection processes that I have been following, but most of us veterans laugh at them. They are a joke. Uh, they are not something that we believe in the, the, the psychology uh, community feel really are tailored towards how we feel as veterans post-service and depending on what our traumas are. So how is it that we collect this information and find the best way possible to find out on, because they're wanting us to report on this quarterly. So in the past 30 to 90 days, how have you felt as a veteran? Well, you know, I can't lump that all into one feeling because I have good days and I have bad days. So how do you collect this information? So we collect it weekly and actually sometimes daily because we're, we're open all the time. We're 24 seven pretty much. Uh, they have a code to the door they can come here anytime they want and somebody meets up with them you know we collect this information and how i collected this and and kind of going i'm collecting what they said they told me to collect which is the pcl fives and the Beck's depression so i'm still collecting those quarterlies i'm like fine i'll i'll do what you ask and i'll have these filled out and i'll report them to you so i've been doing that but on top of that i created my own form and if you'll see i posted a link to our testimonial and you guys can share this you can you know, it's open source, whatever you guys can use it however you want. But in on my testimonial page, you'll see screenshots from I use a, I use a platform called Jotform. And in that I created a form so they can show so there's part of what what is quantitative is the quantitative part is number one, them filling out the report in the first place showing their attendance. The second part that is quantitative is and you can open up too if you want if you go to veteran services and you can you can try to fill out a form on your own. So yeah, go down, so you scroll down and you're gonna click uh, sign out. And I'll go down a little bit further. So this is M5, my end processing, but then right here is the sign out. And then the, if you click on sign out right there, and then there, it gives you the option of, you know, you put in your name. This is the data that I'm collecting is the day of the week that they're out there, what program they're involved in, which is Sunday shop day, a personal project throughout the week. Lima Charlie is our veteran peer support group that's every Thursday night, or they're just volunteering because even volunteering helps them. I had I had two of them here today before I did this uh, this virtual meeting. And then down at the bottom, another part of qu quantitative, uh, or qu yeah, quantitative is, bef and it's not only quantitative, but it's also qualitative. So how did you feel before, like when you came in, so they come in at nine o'clock in the morning, and by the end of the day, how did they feel? So there is, how they felt and then they also get to put another qualitative thing is what they did and you'll see in the screenshots is when they hit the submit button it on on the um testimonial page you'll see those are the screenshots from them filling those forms out so you'll see little stories in there of of you know I, i've heard that same story and it's an amazing feeling eric when you hear i had this one of these guys daughter give me a hug and she was crying and she's like, I got my dad back. Like that gets you out of bed in the morning, like knowing that you've like affected someone's life that way. And then you affected one of, you know, their people in their lives, you know? So I'm just like open sourcing this and, and they're about to publish us uh, in this December, but this is how I've collected my information from these guys voluntarily from these guys. And I just redact their name and their last four. Um, and you can kind of go through and see some of their stories. Um, and like I said, I'm a little bit behind these guys, like 55 to 60 guys fill these out every single Sunday and Thursday. 
So like I, it's, I do the website design too. So I have a hard time keeping it up to speed and screenshotting every single one of these things. And, but this is how I collect it. And you're free to, I mean, if it helps you or it works with your organization, I know every organization is different. Um, but this is one of the things that I'm collecting for the Indiana U university study that's, that is already completed. It's just now that they're putting together their thing. So they've liked yeah, how yeah. I've collected, but they've also used the PCL fives and the Baxter depression inventory. Those are the two mandatory things. I'm trying to get my foot in the door first before I say, hey, us veterans think that this is junk. It needs to be revised. This is old, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely one thing. And actually Tim and his team kind of got to observe this because we don't meet face-to-face -face with them. Almost everything we do, unless it's an event, everything we do is virtual. Um, you know, I'd say 90% of the people we work with, I've never met in person. Um, and so trying to get them to complete a form on a daily basis, like not coming to a physical place and connecting with one of us personally every day can be hard, but that's something that I think, thank you for sharing that, that as we look to our cohort groups um, and we shift to that model and we have a little bit more intentional time together that we could, you know, collect data on twice, twice a month um, instead of looking at a quarterly basis or twice a year like we do now. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks, Jason. And that's a, that's a great idea. Um, you know, my, my gears in my head are already spinning on different ways we can incorporate um, not only the data that, um, you know, Tim and I, the team here has put together, it's kind of used for this project, but also outside information too. Um, you know, going to uh, the newsletters that Eric and his team put together. I think this is great stuff that you can incorporate into the into the dashboard somehow. Um, the testi testimonials on their page, also outside information like Jason shared. Um, you know, there's there's a ton of stuff out there in regards to research that's been done, um, demographic information maybe all kinds of things that you can bring into this tool um, or visualization to kind of help tell your story. Um, let me see, let me transition over here. Was there any other questions before I before we close? I know we're, we're coming past time a little bit, um, but I do wanna make sure that at least the challenge itself is clear uh, to the audience at, at hand today. And if it's not, um, or if you share it with uh, your community and network, um, for them to participate, you know, definitely have them reach out to us or connect with us if there's um, either something gone wrong or um, if they have any further questions. I, I'm a little bit new to it. Like this is my first time in here. I actually heard of, I heard of you guys through the Indiana Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of new to this. What is the, the quarterly challenge, uh, I guess? So what we like to do in our group is very unique. Um, we're a Tableau user group. And typically in Tableau user groups, you may you know, hear from a speaker and learn some tips and tricks, um, something that you can take away and implement within your own work. But at the Veterans Advocacy Tableau user group, we like to take that a step further. Uh, one, our, our mission is to kind of provide a community where veterans can come together and learn from each other, um, especially if they're, they're looking to break into the data industry. But what we're trying to do is once a quarter team up with a, a kind of a veteran run organization or an organization that is advocating for veterans, um, something like uh, what you're doing and, and what Eric and his team are doing. What we like to do is team up with them and, and help those organizations either tell their story using data, um, help provide a platform where they can spread awareness of their mission and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, but more importantly, um, helping out the community. So with the quarterly challenge, the premise is, uh, you know, Eric's provided us some data. We're gonna turn that over to our, our members here at the community, uh, let them noodle on the data and actually build something using Tableau um, to present to Eric and his team. Uh, they can use this as a, a way to build their portfolio, to break into the data industry if, if, or um, hone their skills, learn something new, gather feedback from the community members and leaders on the team. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to our members as well. Uh, but that's that's kind of the premise of it. 
um, is to take on a challenge, build a data visualization, and hopefully at the end of that, Eric and his team can take that, that work um, and utilize it um, to either find uh, more sponsors or to gather more donations or to just drive a data-driven um, visualization and decision-making. Does that sum it up, Tim? Or did you guys have any? Other yeah, I was on, I'll, also gonna um, ask Jason or sure. any other if uh, if um, how new to Tableau are you, and um, I mean, do you have an experience with it? No. Okay. <laughs> My first time hearing of Tableau. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So you're very new. Um, so we can we can work together, and um, I mean, if you're interested in it. Um, we can we can show you uh, what it is. It's actually um, free to use on. Uh, it's called Tablet Public, and you can download it. Um, but it's uh, it's it's just basically a data visualization software and tell stories with data. Um, so yeah, uh, Ethan's gonna bring it up here. Uh, it's it's pretty intuitive to use. Uh, these are examples of what he's done. Um, but you can get really, really fancy. Um, I'm, I'm not that fancy. Um, I, I stick, uh, I'm, I'm pretty basic when it comes to, uh, visualizations. Uh, you don't, you don't have to be this good. Um, but, uh, and the, and the data that, um, Eric has in the Google docs is, is pretty clean, is, is very clean. Um, so it, it, it should be easy to work with. So if you're interested in, in learning more about Tableau and how to use it and stuff, please reach out to us. Yeah, this is this is Tableau. So this is what you would call the authoring interface. And this is where you can build data visualizations and put together dashboards. But really, it, it's a tool that um, you can use as kind of a, a way to visualize data and tell a story. For instance, this is something I just recently put together where I've taken YouTube data um, and you can select a date and it will show you if there was a Tableau user group on that date that presented. And you'd be able to select that Tableau user group and play their, their recorded video oh, directly welcome. from this tool. Um, other things you can um, drive data or data driven decisions at a business level um, by looking at sales data and stuff like that. Um, let's see if I have a thing I can share on that end of things. Do you want to do your um, the perseverance one that you did for the? Let's see, I'll share this blog. I actually just uh, published this blog today. But again, this is just another way that you can visualize data. So this is a scatter plot of different subcategories from a business, looking at profit ratio and sales. And the cool, unique thing about Tableau is it provides interactive ways that the user um, can allow the, uh, the audience to kind of drill into these, to these data. So I can select a subcategory. I can see all the product types underneath that and then go down a little bit more granular. Um, so there's a lot of interactivity within Tableau, uh, but again, it's just a way that you can visualize data um, and tell a story or to make decisions on. Any other questions on the quarterly challenge? And if you do, uh, just, just reach out to us, either uh, Twitter or email or, or whatever. Yeah, definitely, for sure. Um, so we only have four minutes left. Do we just want to go over the, the job board that you have? Yeah, we can quickly go through that stuff. Um, so in closing, uh, we do have a job board we like to post. Um, there's a couple job opportunities at Playfair Data, especially if you're in the Kansas City or our Orlando area um, or looking to relocate to those areas. So we have a senior data engineer position open. This would primarily be working with Altrix and building out structured data sources. Also probably SQL would be a good skill um, for this position. And then we have our senior Tableau engineer position. Um, this would most likely be doing a lot of the things that I would be doing. Um, it could be uh, data science work with statistics, using R or Python, 
um, but it could also be uh, developing Tableau dashboards and stuff like that. We also had our friends at Data Meaning. Um, they presented last week, Yamil. Um, they do have one position open, um, kind of Tableau, Altrix related, but as a trainer. Um, if you're interested in that, you can follow that. Um, I was a little bit lazy and late to the game. I couldn't find any like specific jobs on USA Jobs um, like I did on our prior event. Um, but as always, I'll just post the link uh, at usajobs.gov if you're interested in going there and checking out some more positions. Um, last, uh, just talking about future events upcoming. Tomorrow, I'll be presenting to the KC group. Uh, so if you're interested in the Kansas City area, you can join that group. Um, it's also going to be virtual. So if you're just interested in learning um, about the six components of layered graphics, I definitely um, recommend that you attend. It's going to be great. And that's it. Really, that's all we had. Um, so thanks for joining. If there's any questions about the challenge, reach out and let us know. I'm happy to help you through it. Um, if you're looking to participate, um, like I said, we'll provide feedback and stuff like that if you submit your work. Um, but that's it. Thanks, everybody, for attending. And I'll kind of open it up to uh, anybody that has any closing thoughts or just wants to hang out and uh, network. Thank you. Thank you all for the opportunity to, to share our work today. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, as veterans, I, I hope you uh, find it as, as something that is inspiring and um, if it speaks to you, please do reach out so that we can we can support you through our community as well. Yeah, Eric, um, Zach, it goes without saying. Thanks for coming. This is it was very powerful uh, the messaging. So really appreciate it, and thanks for um, presenting to our group. Um, yeah, what you guys are doing is is just fantastic, and it's it's great to see that in the community, and it's very impactful. 